Let's now get into the three types of unemployment. The first type of unemployment, probably the healthiest kind of unemployment, is something called frictional unemployment. Frictional unemployment is just the everyday difficulties of matching the best employer to the best employee and vice versa. Uh, when it comes to frictional unemployment, I like to think of a friend of mine. I knew him, he got a, a master's degree in a highly in-demand field, and he graduated one May. This friend of mine, even though he had a 4-0 from a top university in the world, like literally one of top three in the world, uh, 4-0, master's degree in an extremely in-demand tech field, did not get a job. All of his classmates had jobs uh, by, by, I mean, by the time they graduated, they had jobs lined up. He didn't get a job until end of September. Why? Because he wanted specifically to work for one of very few companies in a very specific location. He was unemployed because of frictional unemployment. The difficulty of him finding the perfect job for him. So, this is a healthy kind of unemployment. Short term usually, a few months at most, often only a few weeks. And it's basically only caused by the difficulty of matching the perfect employer to the perfect employee. However, after the 2007-2009 recession, other kinds of unemployment started increasing. Long-term employment, unemployment started increasing. Here's 2005. This is unemployment uh, duration. We see that two-thirds of unemployment was less than 14 weeks. That's just about three months. Take a look at the 2010 graph. In 2010, two-thirds of unemployment was over 14 weeks. That's a significant increase in how long people were unemployed. More people were long-term unemployed than short-term unemployed. So why does that matter? We'll get to that in a moment. Frictional unemployment is usually the majority of US unemployment because the US economy is evolving so quickly and changing so rapidly. As we discussed in uh, the first video, Changes in the economy cause people to lose their jobs. And, but also, the changes in the economy create new in-demand jobs. For instance, this blew my mind. In February 2014, 4.6 million new jobs were created. But also, 4.4 million new job separations occurred. That means 4.6 million people were hired and 4.4 million people were fired. In total, only 200,000 new jobs were created in February. But that's because of an explosion of new jobs and a bunch of old jobs disappearing. And this occurs every single month. All right, so moving on from frictional unemployment, we're gonna start talking about this longer term unemployment that started showing up after the 2007 crisis, but has been with us for all of human history. Uh, this is called structural unemployment. Structural unemployment is long-term unemployment caused by changes to the economy that make it hard for workers to find jobs. Go back to our Luddite example. The Luddites faced structural unemployment. The economy had permanently changed in such a way that their skills were not as useful as they used to be. And so, Luddites, because they'd been replaced by machines, could no longer find work. The city of Pittsburgh, for instance, has suffered from a great deal of structural unemployment by the moving of steelwork jobs abroad. The city of Detroit has also suffered from structural unemployment. Thousands upon thousands of people whose skill set was connected to the American auto industry have found themselves unemployable after all those jobs moved abroad. When the economy changes in significant long-term ways that make people unable to find work, that is structural unemployment. 
usually this is caused by major economic shocks, new technologies, globalization, and changes in what a country produces. While, of course, an evolving dynamic economy is a good thing, cars are better than they've ever been, steel is extraordinarily cheap, and so many new technologies are available to us, there are very real costs, structural unemployment. Structural unemployment means that uh, once productive members of the economy are now unable to work, which means they are no longer producing economic output and adding value to the economy. Not only are these people not adding economic value, the people who are long-term unemployed suffer significantly from that. More stress, more depression, more suicide, and measured lower levels of happiness. You only need to look at Appalachia or segments of the American Rust Belts to see the real social consequences of structural unemployment. Structural unemployment can also be caused by laws. Structural unemployment is a much bigger problem in the United States than it is in, in Europe than it is in the United States because Europe is much more strictly uh, regulated in terms of its employee protection laws. Unions are stronger in Europe than in the United States. Unemployment benefits are stronger in the United States. Uh, so, so, sorry. Unemployment benefits are stronger in Europe, minimum wage laws are, strong, or laws are stronger in Europe, unions are stronger in Europe, and employment protection laws are stronger in Europe. Some of these things are good things, right? A, a higher minimum wage means that minimum wage workers earn more. Stronger unions give uh, people who are in unions more protection against corporations. So these are all things that have real positive consequences, but they also have negative consequences, especially when it comes to unemployment. Let's work through that. Let's start with the minimum wage. A minimum wage is higher in Europe than the United States. So is the median wage, the average wage in Western Europe. But recall chapter three and four. What happens when there is a higher wage, perhaps higher than an equilibrium wage for low-skilled workers. Well, what this should mean is a surplus of labor. What does a surplus of labor look like among workers? A surplus is more supply than demand. In unemployment, a surplus is people who want to work but can't. How did we define unemployment? People who want to work but can't. So the minimum wage creates more unemployment and thus there is more unemployment in Europe than in the US. How much are we talking? In France a quarter of uh, workers under the age of 25 were unemployed or wannabe workers. In the United States only 13 percent were unemployed. Now of course France and the US are different in a variety of ways but a great deal of the reason for this disparity is minimum wage and other employment protection laws. Take a look at it illustrated here on our supply and demand curve. We see that at the market wage, there is no surplus or shortage of labor. The supply and the demand for labor are exactly equal and we have an equilibrium employment level. When we raise the minimum wage above the market level though, we see that a bunch of people wanna work, but employers only wanna hire a few. A bunch of people wanna work but employers only want to hire a few. We call that a surplus of employees or unemployment. The higher the minimum wage then, the larger the amount of unemployment. Another very important uh, thing for understanding structural unemployment is unions. Now, imagine you work at Walmart and you decide you want to raise. So you go in and you tell the owner of the Walmart you work at, I want to raise. What will that person do? They'll probably laugh in your face and fire you. 
You see, you can't actually bargain with an employer because you're just one person and they're the giant corporation. But what if every single employee of the Walmarts and all of the employees of every Walmart in the tri-state area all at once said, we're not gonna work unless you pay us $3 more. Maybe Walmart would have to pay higher wages. This is what a union does. Unions represent workers and bargains with employers collectively and thus makes the workers stronger. Uh, however, excessively strong unions can have an effect similar to minimum wages. This, yeah, this is, strong unions mean that you can't fire anyone. They have protected their workers so well that even bad workers are protected. Thus, everyone wants to work, companies can't hire people, and so they are very, or can't fire people, and so they're very hesitant to hire people, it leads to higher levels of unemployment. Uh, as with other employment protection things, unions are more powerful in Europe than in the United States. In the United States, many states use something called the at-will employment doctrine. The at-will employment doctrine is the idea that employees may quit and employers may fire employees at any time for any reason or no reason at all. It's the basis of the U.S. employment law. But there are some worker protections available in the U.S. and even more in Europe. So why would you want employee prote employment protection laws? Well, it means that companies can't just fire you for challenging them or for wanting to perhaps have a baby or for being a minority. And it creates insurance for workers who have full-time jobs. These are good things, but they also make labor markets less flexible because if you can't fire someone who is not productive, you can't hire someone new on who is more productive. Less flexible and dynamic labor markets mean less innovative and slower growing. Also, because uh, it's harder to fire workers, it increases the duration of unemployment because the economy has less churn. There's less new jobs opening up and people stay unemployed for longer because companies are more hesitant to hire. Finally, em uh, employment protection laws increase unemployment rates among young, minority, and risky workers. Why is this? Imagine you are an employer. You can hire either a skilled worker for $15 an hour, or someone who just graduated college and has no work experience for $7 an hour. Who will you choose to hire? Maybe you'll say, you know what? I'm gonna try out that $7 uh, an hour guy. I don't know anything about it. He's a little risky, but if he's not very good, I'll fire him and hire the skilled guy later. And so companies hire these young, risky workers. Imagine on the other hand, I told you, you can hire one of these two guys, but whichever one you hire, you cannot fire. Well, you're probably gonna hire the, the guy who you know is a skilled worker. You don't wanna get stuck with a dud worker. This means that uh, employment, unemployment rates rise especially among people who are considered riskier workers. Risky investments. Companies don't take chances giving young workers chances. They instead continue to hire what they know works which often means that young, especially minority male workers, end up suffering the most from employment protection laws. Let's read this graph. We see that the more rigid the employment index is, the, long, the higher long-term unemployment is. The United States has a comparatively uh, very flexible uh, employment index 
and also comparatively low long-term unemployment. The U.S. government can also take actions to reduce structural unemployment. These are called active labor market policies. These policies are aimed to help structurally unemployed people get back to work, especially by making them no longer structurally unemployed. Someone structurally unemployed when they aren't valuable to the work environment. And so active labor market policies try to make people more valuable to the labor markets. This includes job retraining, a big buzzword right now, where the goal is to give uh, unemployed workers the skills necessary to get cutting edge jobs. So structural unemployment is increased by changes to the economy that make workers outdated. It's also increased by tighter and stronger labor regulations. But structural unemployment can, in theory, be decreased by active labor market policies. In reality, I'm skeptical how effective these are. Most of the time, they don't actually have a very large effect. It's very hard, after all, to retrain someone who has spent 40 years as a line worker in Detroit to suddenly be a Starbucks barista or work uh, as a, a tech contractor. Our third type of unemployment is cyclical unemployment. Cyclical unemployment is unemployment that is correlated with the business cycle. Here is a history of the US economy over the last 60, 70 years. We see these gray lines are recessions. Our orange uh, trail here is the civilian unemployment rate. What do we read on this? We see that every time there's a recession, unemployment skyrockets. Here's stagflation. Here's the recession of the 80s. Here's the tech bubble. Here's the Great Recession. Unemployment increases during a recession for two reasons. When GDP is falling, the definition of a recession, firms are producing less stuff. When you're producing less stuff, you don't need as many workers. Further, the fact that people are not working and machines aren't working makes it harder to make new jobs. Uh, in later chapters, we'll start talking about how some economists, particularly those of the Keynesian and Neo-Keynesian schools, think that the government can resolve this problem. Basically though, because less is being produced, firms need less workers, and these, lower, these people who are now unemployed are also not spending money, which means other businesses are hurt, and so this whole thing cycles together and the economy trends downward. Here's a bunch of data points from various years of the US economy. And we see that in years where there was a recession, 2006, 1984, 1990, the economy also did worse. When there's a recession, lower GDP growth rates unemployment increases. See over here? When there's a recession, sorry, I, I, I missaid some of those things earlier. Let me try that again. These are various year points. These years over here have low GDP growth rate. The economy is either barely growing or even shrinking. When the economy is barely growing or even shrinking, what do we read on this graph? the unemployment rate grows, it gets bigger. Over here, we have years where the economy is doing really, really well. 
it's growing at six to eight percent more stuff every year, higher real GDP, real output. What do we see? We see that unemployment decreases in those years. To understand sick wheel unemployment, we have to understand something called the natural unemployment rate. The natural unemployment rate is basically the number of people who are looking for a job and will find it soon, plus the number that's frictional unemployment. Frictional unemployment is the number of people looking for work and will find it soon, plus structural unemployment, the number of people who have skill sets that are no longer useful in the economy. We see here that the natural unemployment rate's pretty steady. It stays between four and 7%. But the actual unemployment rate skyrockets up and down along with the business cycle. The, tr uh, the rates of frictional and structural unemployment do not change quickly. But cyclical unemployment can skyrocket in only a few months. Look here at what happened in 2007. The economy went from very low unemployment to huge unemployment rates in a few years. Now, earlier we defined the labor force as adults, non-institutionalized civilians, either working, employed, or not working but looking for work, unemployed. To calculate the size of the labor force relative uh, to the size of the uh, labor force participation rate, that is, the size of the labor force relative to the adult population, we add the labor force, that is, unemployment plus employment. We divide the labor force by the adult population. So earlier we said that the labor force was 155.5 million. If the adult population is 200 and 47.4 million, then our labor force participation rate is 62.9%. Guess I'll just finish this up on this video. Obviously, labor force participation is not determined only by personal tastes. Take a look at this chart here. We see that the part of the population that actually is working the most is 25 to 54 year olds. That's an over 80% labor force participation rate. Only 34% of people between 16 and 19 are working, and only 19% of people above the age of 65 are still working. We also see that countries uh, can differ in their natural unemployment rates significantly. You see, the United States has a nearly 70% labor force participation rate whereas France has only a 40% labor force participation rate. Some of this is determined by culture. For instance, Japan has a very different work culture than France does. Some of it is also determined by laws. For instance, in France, uh, there are a lot more social benefits guaranteed to non-working people than there are in the United States. There are also higher tax rates, and the higher tax rates are the less incentive you have to work. The more money you have to give up, right? The less you are willing to work. So these countries differ in their labor force participation rates dramatically, correlated with tax rates, culture, and social benefits.